here today. Hope you had a great weekend. Welcome to the last week before our first deadline. Um, as always, we've got a, a full docket today. We've got four, five bills today. And so um, we're going to allow 10 minutes of testimony for each bill. If testimony reaches that 10 minute mark, Ms. Green will hold up some kind of a cutoff remarks notification. And um, Ms. Elling, wherever she is, is going to do a two minute heads up. So we hope everybody's respectful of that 10 minute um, guideline. For members of the committee, um, we're also hearing the omnibus bill today. And just FYI, um, a final time um, amendments and um, testimony for or against the omnibus bill we'll be doing on Wednesday. So that's the plan for the week. Welcome everybody. Bobby Joe Champion, Senator, President of the Senate. Okay. Should we just... Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Abler. Um, the, the 10 minute rule for total testimony is an interesting idea and probably makes sense uh, if the uh, proponents and opponents are balanced. So just if you could be considerate that if there's some people who really like it and then the opponent has like 30 seconds, that wouldn't be fair. So thank you. If you just keep it. I don't know what that's going to land like today, but just in principle. Sometimes if they're having a limited testimony, then the, the, propo the proponents get a certain number of minutes and the opponents get a certain number of minutes. Just if a thought. If that's a problem today, I'd appreciate it if you brought it to my attention. Thank you. Sincerely. Okay. Thank you. Senator Champion, thank you for an another appearance before our committee. Well, thank you. Whenever you're ready, but like now. I am ready right now. So, Mr. Chair and committee, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to hear this important piece of legislation, which is Senate file number 1981. And let me just briefly describe what this is about. Aaron's Law is what we call it, is uh, this law tells children in Minnesota if someone is touching them in a private area to tell a trusted adult. If they are telling them to keep a secret, it is an unsafe secret, and to tell a trusted adult. That's what this does. Just so you know that nine, nine out of ten children don't tell when they're sexually abused. This allows the abuser to repeatedly abuse some children. This allows the pedophile in some cases to have multiple victims. Some children are repeatedly sexually abused, go home uh, to the, uh, uh, and, and become abused. This creates a silent epidemic. Pedophiles and sexual predators will revolve their lives around having access to children. They will participate in grooming of children and parents. Some pedophiles will have more than two to 300 victims in their lifetime. We know this because they sometimes take pictures or, or they document their abuse. Minnesota can and must change that. Aaron's Law, which is before you, casts a safety net for the children of Minnesota, and this bill sets the low bar for personal body safety for children, kindergarten through 12th grade. If a school is not doing anything on the topic, then the low bar is that they must present personal body safety for children for one hour a year. We're asking for them to have to present this for one hour a year, and this could be held in an open assembly. This information can come from the Department of Education to the superintendents, then to the schools in a PowerPoint presentation. One person can read information and present it in an open assembly if they want. The whole idea is for us not to be as prescriptive to tell them exactly what to do because these school districts know exactly what's best for their population. And so, like for an example, if some, some school is already doing something on good touch, bad touch, or stranger danger, Great, they, they can keep doing what they're doing. If the school is covering this in a small classroom, great, keep doing that. 
We are not telling schools how to do it. That is what I'm trying to say. But if the information presented, as an example, does not include unsafe secret, the bill will require them to add that information in. Children deserve to know that their body parts are private. Children deserve to have a vocabulary to, dis to describe abuse such as, he touched me in a private area. Aaron's law has been introduced in every state in, in the entire country, and by 2017, I, I, I believe, it's been passed in nearly 40 states as mandatory. Aaron's law currently here is discretionary, so you'll see in our bill that it says must and not may. It is not a curriculum. It is personal body safety, which is safety information, like a fire drill or a tornado drill. No child will ever be tested on this information or graded on it. It is not a curriculum, as I already mentioned. This, this law, which we refer affectionately as Aaron's Law, Minnesota, is a bipartisan bill. It is widely accepted by both Democrats and Republicans. And if this is so adopted by this uh, committee at, or, or by the legislature, it will start in September 2023. Uh, and other states have been really successful. There's been news stories about this presentation that students disclosed that they were experiencing sexual abuse after, a, as a result of this. My main, sub, my main message to us all is that we can stop this. One thing I think is important for us to know is that if we don't do anything, if we don't step in, Students and, and, and someone is, is harmed in any shape, form, or fashion that, it, that they, students sometimes turn to drugs or self-harm or suicide. It can create mental illness. Many people who are sexually abused go on to have difficulties in life such as homelessness or incarceration. And we think it's important in high time that we take a real proactive step in making it mandatory for us to have these important, this important conversation, for lack of a better word. So it, lastly, but certainly not least, currently, as I mentioned that in Minnesota, we have a discretionary law uh, uh, when it comes to Aaron's uh, law, but we want it mandatory. It is like a seatbelt law that says when you get in your car, you can fasten your seatbelt if you want to, but you don't have to. That's what the current law says. But our current seatbelt law says when you get in the car, you have to put on your seatbelt. It is a, 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 a primary offense and not a secondary offense. So this change would be sort of like that. We are asking those folks who are in our various school districts to do what is important to make sure that this message goes forward and that we protect our children. So that's it in a nutshell. I want to contextualize that. And I do have with me. Mr. Chair, uh, for, for brief testimony, and I did say that because I told her about how, uh, how busy this work is today, uh, April Kane. Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Begin, thank you. Uh, Chair and members, thank you for allowing me to be here. My name is April Kane. I'm a citizen advocate. I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. I was sexually abused by my father who was an alcoholic. And in the building that I lived in, uh, the front door very often didn't lock, didn't close, and I lived across the street from a pedophile, but I didn't know it at the time. My mother allowed me to go into the basement by myself, which was the laundry room, and I was raped by that pedophile in the laundry room. When I came up to my apartment, my mother could see that I was upset but I had no vocabulary to describe abuse of any kind. So she said to me, you are no longer allowed to go down into the basement. It was never mentioned again. I didn't tell until I was 53 years old and testified in a committee in the house. Nine out of 10 um, children don't tell when they're sexually abused and often they're threatened by the abuser who will tell them, um, thank you so much, you're so kind. Um, if you tell, I will kill you, I'll kill your pets, I'll kill your family, they won't believe you, I'll set your house on fire, I'll come back, etc. So the key to Aaron's Law Minnesota is that it addresses unsafe secret and it teaches children if someone's touching you in a private area and telling you it's a secret, it's an unsafe secret and tell a trusted adult. As Senator Champion was kind enough to say it is very important. I read in the news recently that the mother of Jacob Wetterling has written a memoir 
And Jacob Wetterling, if anyone here doesn't know, was abducted and raped by a sexual predator and killed. And that same predator had sodomized another child. And as horrible as his crimes are, I believe that that person probably was raped as a child. And the person that raped him was raped as a child. My point being that this is a cycle and we need to stop it. And this is very, very important for the children of Minnesota. One of the most important bills you'll ever sign. And I ask you if you'd be kind enough to uh, unanimously pass this bill to education finance where the honorable Senator Kunesh, I hope, would give us a hearing so that we could stand up for the children of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Members, questions or comments? Senator Abler. Well, Mr. Chair, I know you're in a rush, but I think it's a really good bill, uh, and I think it's a really valuable idea, and I appreciate the, the way that it's brought forward as a one-hour thing, just to make sure that everybody knows this. And if you need, I'd be happy to move that. I'd be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Education and Finance when you're ready, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion, um, Ms. Kane. Um, you know, sometimes when we elected officials, we have, we're at a loss for words, and but we know what we need to do, and um, this is one of those times. So I appreciate you bringing this bill forward. Um, Senator Abler made a motion um, to re refer it to education finance. All those in favor, say aye. Or um, aye. Senator Champion, any final thought? Okay. No. All, the, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee. Thank you, Chair and members. Senator Swazinski, to your bill. I saw that sigh. <laughs> um, so we're out a little bit out of sequence here. Um, so this bill um, has been a, long, a lot of work by a lot of people to get this, to try to make it right. And I'm going to let the testifiers um, speak to it as soon as they get up here. And... Um, so um, this is a pretty personal bill for me, the Holocaust. Uh, I used to lead students to Auschwitz on a field trip, not on a field trip, wow, that's, I can't believe I just said that, on an experience of a lifetime. And I have personally been to Dachau and Buchenwald and Bergen-Belsen and Treblinka and um, Belgic. And because um, it's been an important part of my story, so to speak, and my development as a human being. And I think it's an important subject to teach. And whenever I used to teach the Holocaust, because I somehow weaved it into the curriculum, um, into an um, 86-minute lecture or lesson, um, no matter what the subject matter I was teaching, because I thought it was that important of a subject. And the second to the last slide that I had up on the, on the PowerPoint was a, a quote by um, a, a Greek poet named Ascalis, and the quote went like this, in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until our, in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And that was the second to the last slide I showed in my Holocaust presentation. And I didn't want my Holocaust lectures to be, uh, look at how horrible this was, look at how horrible this was, look at how horrible this was, and it was horrible. But I wanted it to somehow give them hope. And so the, um, so because there, were, there has been a lot of other genocides before and since 
the probably maybe perhaps the most famous um, genocide, the, the Holocaust. And so the very last slide I showed my students was this. And it was a quote where I said, I tell this story not to weaken you, but to strengthen you. And that is why I think genocide instruction and Holocaust instruction is so important. A couple issues ago, the Atlantic said, where are all the memorials in the United States to the genocides that have occurred here? And the whole article is all about how Germany has come to terms with things they have done in their past. And, but the United States, according to the author of this article, we still haven't come to grasp um, with some of the mistakes we've made in our nation's history. So maybe um, we can correct some of these problems um, f f in our own history. And, um, but where are my testifiers? Oh, come on up. <laughs> Sorry. So it's an important subject. I appreciate it. I, um, first time I got it to see Senator Coleman up on the big screen was when her passion for this topic was, um, was ev evident a couple years ago. Um, and so um, I think, I hope this has bipartisan support. But anyways, with that said, um, welcome. And uh, Senator Susinski, would you like to move your amendment to get your bill in order? Uh, oh yeah, there's an amendment. Thank you, Se um, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Sosinski moves the A1. A23. A23, my man, is exactly what I said. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed? The m amendment is adopted. Okay. Um, Senator Sosinski, your first testifier is Joe Eggers. Okay. Uh, please introduce yourself to the committee, and then you may begin your testimony. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's... Joe Eggers, I'm the Interim Director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Minnesota. Uh, when Dr. Stephen Feinstein created our center back in 1997, it was amongst the first centers dedicated to studying the Holocaust and genocides in the country. And Dr. Feinstein envisioned a research center that would, could nurture the needs of faculty and students at the University of Minnesota and respond to the growing needs and numbers of educators across the state looking for resources in their classrooms. Since then, the center has been at the forefront of preserving memory of genocide and raising awareness through the development of teaching materials and workshops. And throughout my near decade of working with the center, I've had the privilege of working with numerous communities whose legacies are tainted by the legacies of genocide. A paramount for all of these communities is the desire to teach Minnesotans about their histories. As one community leader told me, genocide is woven into the fabric of Minnesota. And he's right, for the last five decades, tens of thousands of foreign-born people have found a safe home in Minnesota after fleeing their homelands in the wake of violence and even genocide. Since the 1970s, Khmer, Hmong, Somali, Bosniak, and more recently, Ukrainians have found sanctuary in our state. And these numbers don't factor in groups like Armenians, Jews, and other earlier waves of Ukrainians who settled in Minnesota in the early 20th century in the face of persecution and violence in their homelands. And also doesn't include Minnesota's indigenous nations who've routinely been subjected to genocidal policies in the state since the first treaty in 1805. Our teachers speak to this need. At one of the workshops I was asked by an educator, these students are in my classrooms. How can I possibly tell them their history? And this question is su supported by surveys we've done with educators that point to the lack of resources as the primary reason teachers give for not including Holocaust and other genocides in their curriculum. Nearly every respondent has said that including these topics was important to them, yet less than half spend any time on the Holocaust. And that number drops significantly when we factor in other genocides. Members of this committee, we cannot escape the legacies of genocide, but we can better equip teachers for addressing them in their classrooms. A policy that ensures Holocaust and genocide education is incorporated in middle and high school classrooms is an important first step, but providing funding for that supports the development of new, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, but providing funding that supports the development of new resources is critical. Thank you. And I would just like to add that uh, my colleague from the university, Dr. Gabriela Spears-Rico, is unfortunately unable to attend. She had a uh, 
family emergency. So I believe your, her testimony has been circulated and you have uh, her statement as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, we have our next testifier, Luda Anastavzieski. Um, you may introduce yourself for the committee and begin your testimony. Thank you. Esteemed Chair Senator Swadzinski and Ranking Member Senator Coleman, esteemed members of the Senate Policy um, Education Policy Committee, I came here today to speak in support of SF-2442 as a granddaughter of survivors of the Holodomor, the genocide of Ukrainians of 1932-33, and a public educator of 30 years. I am also a chair of the Minnesota Ukrainian American Advocacy Committee that rep represents 17,000 Ukrainians in the state of Minnesota, and I'm a board member at the Ukrainian American Community Center. When I mention the genocide of Ukrainians in 1932-33, known as Holodomor, to my co-workers or American friends and their children, and tell them that millions of Ukrainians were purposefully starved to death and were dying at a rate of 28,000 people per day in June of 1933, they respond, why don't I know about it? Or why didn't I hear about it? And I wonder how much longer this heinous crime will be unknown and unrecognized. In a world where so much is covered by social media, it's hard to imagine the level of censorship practiced in, so in the Soviet Union. The Holodomor resulted in terrible loss of life, with families and children dying in isolation and silence. Another consequence was the loss of collective memory. In Soviet Ukraine, the Holodomor was kept out of public discourse until shortly before Ukrainian independence in 1991. Although my family uh, was affected by the Holodomor, I only learned about it and its impact on my family after coming here. The Soviet regime prevented Ukrainians from processing the trauma inflicted upon them. For more than 50 years, Ukraine could not address the genocide openly. This crime was denied by the Soviet government, and it is still denied by its successor, the Russian Federation. Minnesota's Ukrainian community includes descendants of Holodomor survivors and descendants of Holocaust survivors. Newly arrived Ukrainian refugees bear not only the trauma of Russia's current genocidal war against Ukrainians as a nation, but they also carry the generational scars of those past attempts to erase our ancestors' communities. Just as Joseph Stalin did 90 years ago, so today a brutal dictator is trying to destroy Ukrainians and the Ukrainian identity. There are lessons we can learn from the genocides on Ukrainian lands, both historic genocides and the genocide taking place today. Ukraine is sadly a country where genocide is not only a memory of the past, but a present horror affecting the lives of Ukrainians. Inclusion of genocide studies in our Minnesota social studies standards will allow students to learn to make connections between the genocides of the past and genocides happening today, wherever they may occur. Such inclusion would provide the opportunity for students to analyze genocide's causes and effects and evaluate effective responses and ways to prevent them as a matter of justice and protection of social, of human rights. Teachers' access to the curriculum that includes the study of the Holodomor, the Holocaust, the Armenian, Cambodian genocides, and other genocides will help them to teach students to be informed and in discerning global citizens, able to ass assess and intervene in events in the world around them. I believe that our future leaders need to be equipped with the knowledge and tools to address prejudice, racism, mass disinformation, and brutal tyranny while acquiring an attitude of tolerance towards one another. With these tools, they will be poised to secure a safer and more equitable future for the people of our country and the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our final testifier, Kristen Thompson, please introduce yourself for the committee and you may begin your testimony. Thank you for your time. My name is Kristen Thompson and I'm here to speak to you regarding the importance of the legislation before you, especially the teacher training component. I have unique insight on this topic because in addition to being a history teacher for 19 years in Minnesota schools, I also spent five and a half years at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., where I was the education program coordinator. 
During my tenure at the museum, I developed and facilitated multiple rigorous programs that annually engaged and trained um, hundreds of educational leaders from around the globe. Currently, I'm the founding director of Humanist Network, an educational consulting firm dedicated to developing Holocaust and human rights educational resources. After the Holocaust, the world said never again. Yet we know that human rights violations, atrocities, and genocide continue around the globe today. Institutions and systems that were supposed to protect citizens and uphold democracy failed during the Holocaust. Studying how and why the Holocaust happened helps us find ways to safeguard against making similar mistakes today. With an alarming increase in reported incidents of anti-Semitism, dangerous speech, hate speech, and hate crimes, Holocaust and genocide education is more important now than ever. Studies have shown that Holocaust education develops and strengthens skills of critical thinking, historical inquiry, and empathy. These are skills we want every student to possess and cultivate. We want them to think critically about important issues and understand that they have agency. We want them to seek out credible sources to establish fact-based evidence as they interpret history and find personal relevance. And we want them to be empathetic, compassionate people who are moved to action when confronted with intolerance of any kind. In order for Holocaust and genocide education to do all of those things, teachers must be adequately equipped and trained. Far too often that component is missing from mandates and legislation. Minnesota can be proud that this bill is inclusive of teacher training. Without proper training, many educators are afraid to teach this topic, in part due to the gravitas of the subject and a desire to get it right, to do no harm. And so they become paralyzed by that fear and problematic lessons can emerge. Careful consideration regarding resources and pedagogy must be applied to teaching about the Holocaust and genocide. Curating resources that are both steeped in primary sources to promote historical accuracy and that are aligned with both state and national education standards can be an overwhelming and time-consuming endeavor. So accessibility to credible organizations and institutions that can help provide these resources will be a vital component of this bill. Ms. Thompson, I'm going to have you uh, get to your final concluding thoughts. Thank you. Additionally, many teachers do not have a deep background in the historical facts themselves. Too many times an assumption is made that teachers already know the history. My experience has shown me time and time again that is not the case. Therefore, foundational training should be made available to all educators who will be teaching this topic. Organizations like Humanist Network and the JCRC have developed teaching materials to specifically meet this challenge and train teachers in both historical content and pedagogical practices. Um, finally, an additional recommendation includes supporting teachers to seek out credible organizations and institutions for further training once the foundations have been addressed. This is critical for fostering quality Holocaust and genocide education in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much. Senator Sosinski, would you like to make any closing comments before we go to members? Uh, I'll make them after we hear if we have any questions or comments from members. Sounds good. Members of the committee. Senator Duckworth and Senator Haywood. Uh, just briefly, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Swazinski and your testifiers for bringing forward this bill. Uh, I just have a, a, a fairly simple question. Um, I'm a product of public education here in Minnesota, graduated from Lakeville. And throughout my schooling there, whether it be in junior high or high school, uh, we covered certain things like, you know, we learned about uh, Anne Frank and her family. We watched Schindler's List. Um, uh, we learned about uh, how wrong slavery was, the Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War units that we, that we learned about in history class. We talked about the Trail of Tears and how absolutely tragic that was. We talked about the war in Vietnam and the impacts it had on uh, locals there. We talked about the Desaparecidos in Latin America and some of the things that they and their families had to endure. So I'm just wondering um, if school districts are doing a good job already covering some of these, these topics and aspects. Is this bill going to make them change anything, or will they be found to be in compliance with it already? Thank you. Senator Swazinski. Uh, or Mr. Eggers. I would say uh, the, the example you give of your Lakeville teacher is a fantastic one. I think, unfortunately, a lot of teachers are, are saying that they don't have access to resources, they don't have materials, or aren't properly uh, prepared to talk about this. And we believe that this bill then supports that. So while your example, your experience, I think is really a positive one there, uh, we want to bring that to every teacher in Minnesota that has the opportunity to have these resources, this experience, this knowledge for their classrooms. And I would just um, echo what you said about, I think a lot of teachers worry about doing harm. And as you said, to do no harm, if, this, if that's, we can help more teachers do no harm and do what's right. And I, I'm impressed with your level of education you got in Lakeville schools. 
sincerely. Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thanks. I'm not even going to try, Mr. Chair. Um, but I, I do remember taking a class on the Holocaust at uh, Hamlin, another fine institution, and it was amazing. Just it was just amazing to learn about that. And I also remember, I don't know if it was the Clinton administration with the Rwanda. We all called it genocide, but they wouldn't politically. And it was like a million people, or they're floating down the river, and the Hutus and the Tutsis, or whatever. I was just thought that was just why. And I just wonder how many of the the items you've listed were neglected by the federal administration, I think on a bipartisan basis for reasons of international politics. So I think you're on the right track. I just, um, it seems like what you're doing is making a voluntary program with resources. If I have that right, is that Mr. Chair? Senator Swazinski. Yes, and it does set up a, a advisory council to help yeah. the process. Yeah. Senator no, and I, and I just think it's a good model. And I, th I think these are good ideas we want to weave into our curriculum. School boards across the state want to include these. Teachers want to include them. And I, as you do the uh, give and take, I think you're on to a good method. It's a good bill. And if you don't mind, I'd like to sign on. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Adler. And, and same, Senator Sosinski. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I want to echo a little bit of what Senator Duckworth said, um, not even just with this, but even as we've been going through education policy, I feel like, I mean, it's good, I guess, that we had these things in high school, but I, I'm wondering what were, what happened in the 20 years since I've been in school if these things aren't being taught anymore, or I went to Little Falls Community Schools, and, you know, we had, I, I learned about the past, and we learned about how these things were atrocities and how they're not good, and like, you know, your civics bill, I was, we had a civics class, and we, we had these classes, so I'm just curious, well, what happened if we're not teaching this stuff anymore? Because, you know, I got this education, and I know other people I know, I, from what I understand, did. So it's, I mean, it's not bad. I'm just, I feel kind of like, w w what happened if we stopped teaching this stuff? So, thank you. Um, Ms. Thompson. I think for a lot of teachers, it's become an issue of time, especially for history, social studies teachers. They, every year, there's more added to the curriculum, and they simply run out of time. So the Holocaust, traditionally right now, is actually taught more in English language arts classes than in history, social studies. And so it's often just reading Anne Frank or Elie Wiesel's Night, which primarily take place in 44 and 45. So you've missed all this historical context leading up to it. And oftentimes, ELA teachers have told us that they don't feel confident um, in their own knowledge of the historical context to help that address that for students. So I think that's part of helping teachers really to feel content or to feel confident um, in teaching this and to equip them with the tools that they need that are necessary. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I have a follow-up too, and I think, um, I mean, nothing, I think the teachers, maybe there are some teachers that are do know what they're doing as well, but then we do have to bring in the aspect that some kids just don't, they might not retain it or what, you know what I'm trying to say, they're kids. So maybe they're just not picking up on what we're putting down. So yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Swidinski for uh, bringing this bill before us. Uh, you're right when that first set of social studies standards came out, uh, that mama bear flag in me was raised pretty high. I'm the mother of Jewish children. And uh, we celebrate Hanukkah and Christmas and Easter and Passover. We do both uh, traditions in my household. And uh, on my husband's side, we have quite a, a large Jewish family in New York. And to this day, with the rise of anti-Semitism and attacks on Jewish people, they don't wear any garb that would give away their identity in New York. They don't feel safe. All of their schools have armed guards. And when you see what's happened to the Jewish people over the years, we can't say never again unless we are educating our students on this. And as a, a mother of Jewish children, that was terrifying to me that we would ever consider taking this out of our standards. So I appreciate you making sure that this will continue to be taught. I was texting with a, a member of the Jewish community who said there's a lot of people that our families wish we're at that table testifying. But that can't be right now because of the Holocaust. And so I thank you for this. I think it's good work. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Um, Senator Suzuki, final comments? Um, happy Purim, Senator Coleman. You left off that holiday. Um, no, just it's, um, it's, it's just a hard topic for me in particular. And um, my grandfather had 11 siblings, one girl, 
11 siblings, one, girl, one sister, and eight of his brothers perished in the Holocaust. And so I grew up in a household, and, and a lot of people have similar stories of similar genocides in their family background, and I think it's good for kids to just find out maybe perhaps what their story is, because um, the Armenians, for instance, you know, maybe um, somebody from, from Armenia or Turkey has no idea that that happened in their family history, and to, to, to tell our kids that story among many others can build character and give them a sense of civic engagement and civic responsibility and to help us all leave this world a better place than we found it. So thanks for listening. Well, thank you. Senator Suzinski renews his motion that Senate File 2442 is amended, be passed, and referred to the Committee on Education Fund, excuse me, state government, uh, state and local government and veterans. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Suzinski. Carries. Thank you. Thank you. I think so. I'm like Senator May Quaid, whenever you're ready. We have uh, Senate file 2010, and I believe you have an amendment. I do, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the A1 amendment. This just gets it into the order I'd like it in, some technical changes. All those in favor of the author's amendment say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Member, Senate File 2010 is a bill that puts parameters around active shooter drills and simulations conducted in, pri in public and charter schools, excuse me, not private schools. Um, many of you, if not all of you, have heard stories of active shooter drills in schools, maybe from your own children, or you've experienced them as educators or staff, maybe from constituents. And while we might agree or disagree on the efficacy of these active shooter drills, it remains the fact that uh, many, if not all, of Minnesota's public schools conduct these drills throughout the year as part of a statutory requirement to run five lockdown drills per year. These have become very commonplace um, and are done in a variety of ways, from tabletop exercises to full-scale simulations that can involve things like fake blood, pellet guns, and law enforcement sweeps. We know that these full-scale simulations or drills can be really traumatizing, which is why this bill is crafted to set up culturally appropriate and evidence-based supports for students. Senate File 2010 was born out of the work of a student advisory group called the Sandy Hook Promise, which our testifiers will tell you a little bit more about. And this bill really is an, a, a direct result of their advocacy. Students want to be part of their own safety and they want to be involved in this work. And so this is the opportunity uh, for them to learn how to prevent violence by recognizing early warning signs in their peers and taking action. This bill does not add drills or prescribe how each district needs to run their drills. It just simply says if you're going to run active shooter drills, here's what needs to be considered or provided to support our students, their physical and mental well-being. Um, there are some main elements of the bill. So one, it just defines an active shooter drill versus an active shooter simulation. And simulations are restricted to being off hours, so summers, weekends, just whenever there's not more than 50% of students there. It requires parental notification 24 hours ahead of time, which allows parents to opt their child out of this active shooter drill, and an opportunity for parents of students grade 9 to 12 to opt into a simulation if so desired. It lays out the criteria for active shooter drills, it needs to be accessible, developmentally appropriate, culturally aware, trauma-informed, and inclusive. It also requires time for a post-drill debrief, one hour of violence prevention training that's age-appropriate, 
and then student and, and staff and parents can weigh in to operation and efficacy of the drills. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, I will just, um, before I turn over the testifiers, there's a few of us on this committee that have been in high school not that long ago. I graduated from the schools in my district and um, I haven't even had my 20th high school, has high school graduation yet, anniversary. And what students go through in school now is very different today than what it was then. And unless we have been educators in the classroom and part of these active shooter drills, I don't think we can imagine how incredibly traumatizing it is to endure these. And so putting some parameters around this is incredibly important. And with that, I will turn it over to my testifiers. Some hybrid, some in person. Yes, Chairman. This is Calandrian Kemp, Chairman Squadzinski, Vice Chair Mae Quaid, Ranking Minority Member Coleman, and members of the committee. My name is Calandrian Simpson Kemp. I come to you today in my capacity as State Policy Manager for Sandy Hook Promise. On behalf of Sandy Hook Promise, including our more than 37,000 grassroots supporters across Minnesota, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to the value of ensuring youth feel safe at school. Sandy Hook Promise is a national nonprofit and led by several family members who loved ones was killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School on December the 14th, 2012. At its core, Sandy Hook Promise is a helping organization. We help students and adults identify the signs and signals of someone at risk of harming themselves or others. Through our Know the Signs suite of programs, we also provide training on what to do next. In line with this lens, our mission is to educate and empower youth and adults to prevent violence in school, in their schools, homes, and communities. We understand, however, that not all harm is intentional. This is one reason SF 2010 matters to us. When adults go about the important task of designing student safety measures, it is vitally important to keep students' mental health and wellness top of mind. Despite good intentions, this does not always happen. That is, not every safety approach adults identify as helpful land in the same way with children and youth. In the context of preparing for a potential school shooting, students across differences in age, ability, developmental stage, and life experience need a carefully crafted approach. And they deserve such an approach. SF 2010 is rooted in the idea that student safety is neither a one size fits all nor a free for all. And it speaks to something that has come, become a commonplace, which is active shooter drills. Known by, the, known by many names, including lockdown drills or intruder drills, active shooter drills are the thing most students are familiar with. According to the National Center of Education Statistics, 96% of the nation's public schools have written plans for active shooter situations, and more than 90% of public schools plan to use lockdown drills during the 22-23 school year alone. Yet, there is not a uniform definition for what an active shooter drill is, much less for what it is not. This lack of clarity means a lot. It matters because the gray area, the space in which active shooter drill means one thing to one person and another to the next, has given life to a harmful concept, the active shooter simulation. Drills and simulations are not the same thing. Yet, they alter our conflated conflated even through the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics has called on the nation to, and I quote, and I start with the quote, be cautious about the potential psychological risks of directly involving children in the live, in live exercises and drills, end quote. An active shooter simulation mimics aspects of a real life shooting, such as having law enforcement sweep the hallways with firearms drawn why a person pretends to be the intruder, pounded on classroom doors and shaking door handles. Because simulations mimic aspects of real life shootings, they tend to be anxiety inducing for students and also traumatizing. In fact, they are traumatizing by nature. So what is the upside for Minnesota? SF 2010 includes a clear definition for active shooter drills and separately one for active shooter simulations. These definitions ensure the two approaches are not used interchangeably. They also ensure parents and guardians have a clear understanding of what type of drill their student is and is not undergoing. This is the right thing to do for the parents and guardians' own well-being and their trust in the school. But the bill does not stop there, and thankfully so. 
SF 2010 includes reasonable criteria that schools can use to ensure active shooter drills do not morph into simulations. The criteria is in line with recommendations from the National Association of Resource Officers and National Association of School Psychologists. The definition and the criteria are only made stronger, however, because the bill also exempts students from participating in simulations. This is not only a wise choice, it is a necessary one. After all, students' mental health and wellness should, be, should not be sacrificed at the name of safety. Rather, schools should be a place where students feel safe, where they understand their surroundings and have a clear sense of what the school day will entail. Having, the, having to experience aspects of real life shootings should never be a part of their calculations. In closing, Sandy Hook Promise thanks Senator McQuaid and Abler for sponsoring this bill and the committee for the opportunity to speak to it. It is our wish for students of Minnesota that they be safe in school and also feel safe in schools. SF 2010 is a clear step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barden, go ahead. Yeah, okay. uh, Chair Mozinski, Vice Chair May Quaid, Ranking Minority Member Coleman and members of the committee. My name is John Barden. I've been a Minnesota resident for over 40 years and I'm a grateful supporter for Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, you heard Ms. Kemp talk about how and why Sandy Hook Promise uh, was formed. My connection to the Promise is very personal and underlies my reason for being here. On December 14, 2012, 20 children and six adults were killed in the Sandy Hook Elementary School. And I might just add here that killed is not a word that begins to summarize what happened in that building. On that day, the parents of those little children waited desperately in the Family Unification Center for their ch children to be brought to them. Among those parents was my cousin, Mark Barden. He and his wife, Jackie, waited for his son, Daniel, to be brought to the center, and they were waiting in vain. Today, Mark is the co-founder and CEO of Sandy Hook Promise. On that day, however, he was a devastated parent, a person forever changed, and those of us in extended family have been changed, too, by the realization that we'll never again see Daniel, and literally by the heartbreak I see on that man's face every time I visit. The love of and for children is first and foremost for many of us. Many parents and those who have the honor of helping to raise children, there's little doubt that we would go to the ends of the earth to sue, uh, guarantee their safety. But gun violence continues to be a fact of life for children in America. As a matter of fact, since 2019, it's the leading cause of death for children in America. Those of us who must process the violent taking of a loved one while simultaneously navigating the long shadow of school shootings can find themselves rushing to find solutions. Decision makers such as yourselves may feel pushed in these scenarios amidst people's angst and demands, and in turn, this can be when adults rush to create solutions. When it comes to school shootings in particular, the need to hurriedly identify a solution may not be surprising. After all, why would any civil society not create plans designed to respond to these shootings? However, this rush does not always produce the best outcomes. As you've heard, this undefined thing known as an active shooter drill is one example of the rush to find a solution, and that's why SF 2010 is so critically important. Society, including here in Minnesota, has accepted the notion that preparing students for the potential of a school shooting is necessary, but how we prepare students is vital, and therein lies the problem with something identify, identify, undefined as an active shooter drill. I've also heard, and I'm sure you have too, people use the phrase active shooter drill and active shooter simulation interchangeably. However, as you heard from Ms. Kemp, they are not the same. When done correctly, like any emergency preparedness drill, any active shooter drill can help teach students how to respond in the event of an intruder. However, a deliberate step should be taken to ensure that it is not traumatizing. This is pure cost benefit. At its core, this is what SF 2010 is about. Let's be frank, an active shooter drill, even when done well, is rooted in the idea that students may suffer great harm and even be killed in their school. This is one reason why these drills should never be unannounced. Uh, given what underlies these drills, it's possible the possibility of a school shooting, the surprise factor is never helpful. It can never be helpful to spring the idea of imminent death on children. Uh, you've all heard anecdotal situations where a kid is in school going through one of these drills texting their parents saying goodbye. Mm -hmm. But this is not just my personal opinion. According to the Academy of American Pediatrics, when it comes to preparing students for an active 
shooter situation, the likelihood of trauma is even greater when, quote, when children are deceived so they believe there's an actual attack. Anyway, I can't even begin to. But because they mimic aspects of real life shooting, it's fair to say that an active shooter simulation goes too far. After all, there's no way to mimic a real life shooting without traumatizing students in the process. By exempting students from simulation, SF 2010 decreases the likelihood students will be traumatized in the name of safety. In turn, this is one reason why Minnesota needs SF 2010 right now. Um, I would just say that um, I think this is one of the most sensible pieces of legislation I've ever seen as being intimately familiar with this issue. So, thank you so much for letting me address the committee. Sure. Members? Senator Duckworth. Oh. Just a quick question. Um, Senator Makeway, thanks for bringing this bill forward. Just uh, curious if you might elaborate upon any consultation or feedback you received from uh, districts, administrators, and uh, school resource officers as you were crafting and putting together this bill. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, um, so this was really meant to bring forth uh, the work of young people who are most affected by the school shootings, although we did uh, talk with educators about this and um, also the Department of Education. So uh, seems to be all on the up and up. Haven't heard any pushback yet so far. Senator Kunish. Uh, thank you very much for um, bringing this forward, Senator. As a teacher, uh, you know, in the classroom or in the, my media center for, for 20 years, you know, I, I, we think back about when we first started tornado drills, right? And we'd tell the kids, get down and crouch under your table. Tornadoes were real to them here in Minnesota. I live in uh, near Columbia Heights where we had a terrible, terrible Colum uh, tornado go through and destroy much of our communities. And then um, as more and more trauma began in our society, especially around these mass shootings and um, coming into the schools, we had to make this really terrifying change to the reality of what is in our society uh, with those that have a gun in their hand, automatic weapons, and would take them to a public place such as an elementary school or a high school or a middle school or wherever um, and kill a bunch of people. And that's the reality of the society that we live in. Uh, I can't tell you how many active shooter drills I have had to put, I have had to participate, and how very traumatic that really is. And you might think we're doing it for the good of the kids. But when you have three or four classrooms of kindergartners, because we have not only active um, shooter uh, drills from within the school, but we also have it from outside of the school. So it's a reverse, it's a reverse active shooter drill where the kids come pouring in from the, uh, the outside and into my library media center and we have to have decided where these kids can crouch, where nobody can see them from a window, where nobody can see them from the doorway, where they can't be seen anywhere where if there was a shooter at the door they could shoot through a window or a door at those kids. And I have had many kids crouching down there in tears, absolutely terrified, saying, is this for real? Is this for real? Is there really somebody out there? Are they gonna shoot us? It is absolutely terrifying whether you are a child, whether you're an adult, or whether you're the teacher that has uh, dozens and dozens of children cowering in your library, in your school, because of what's going on in our society. And we can talk about this with the students and we can warn them ahead of time, but I feel like the trauma that we are invoking uh, onto those children it is really more than we can handle, more than they can handle at this time. And I think we really do have to find a better way of preparing our children for what is inevitable 
too many times. So thank you, Senator Mayquaid. Senator Ebler. I have little to add to any of that except thank you for doing this. And uh, I learned from every hearing and I'm glad I'm a co-author. Thank you. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator McQuaid, for bringing this bill forward. I hate that we have to have this bill. Um, I can't tell you how many kids I've seen who are brought in by their parents because they can't sleep at night anymore because they're afraid to go to school, right? Because uh, perhaps one of these drills or simulations was done with the best intention, right? But caused trauma. We were traumatizing children by doing these things. Um, including one of my own. So um, I, again, I, I hate that we have to have this bill. And I think that our goal as a body should be that one day this bill no longer has to exist. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we put that on everybody's radar, that this right now is a solution at this moment, but this is not the final solution that we need to get to. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, Senator Mann said someday we'd like to not have to do this drill and think about it anymore. And I think about um, there might be somebody up at this dais um, who um, is old enough to remember um, duck and cover drills because mm -hmm. of the Cold War and how those became a thing of the past because we got smart as a world. And um, I hope the same thing. Well, maybe there's more than... <laughs> A couple of us. But anyways, um, after Parkland, I asked um, the teachers at the high school I taught with, can I come by I just for five minutes in your class? And um, I asked the soul studies teachers, and maybe 10, eight, six of them said, yeah, come on by. You know, I have time. And um, I'll just never, ever forget walking in after Parkland into this one classroom at Eden Prairie High School. I can remember exactly where she sat and who the teacher was and where the, and um, so how are you guys doing today? And she said um, that every room, every event I go to, I sit down and I map my strategy to flee if I need to flee. And what do I need to grab? And where's the window? Where's the door? Where's the exit? And I sat there listening to this young woman thinking to myself, I never had to think like that, ever. Um, and I just don't know what we're doing wrong. I mean, I have some ideas, <laughs> but we've got to solve this. And I hope someday, as Senator Mann said, um, we put this to rest and we never have to do these drills. And um, I could go on for a long time, but I went, um, I saw the um, speaker, a survivor from, um, um, what was Florida? <laughs> was that Parkland? Um, and I saw, and her whole presentation was describing the police officer picking her best friend's flesh out of her hair. That was her talk. That was her presentation. Um, it wasn't informative. It wasn't insightful. It was just filled with emotion of what she went through um, that day. And um, anyways, um, I hope we get this right. I hope time we get this right. So any final comments on your bill, Senator? Um, thanks for bringing it forward and um, forcing a lot of people to, to talk about what we don't, we don't want to talk about. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Yeah, I'll be honest, when this bill came to me, I avoided it for 24 hours because it was really hard to, I, like, I don't want this bill. I've never actually wanted a piece of legislation less because I don't want this to be the, the condition that we have created in society. What Senator Kunish was describing is what children do in war zones, hiding out of sight of a shooter, um, crouching down and, you know, having objects in a bucket to throw if somebody comes into your classroom, teaching kids how to run, hide, fight. That is literally wiring their brains for trauma. Every single child that goes through these is experiencing a traumatic event. And that is a 
a condition that we allow in our society every single day. And it wasn't one that we all grew up with. And it shouldn't be the one that our kids grow up with. And so I uh, really, really look forward to the day where I can bring the repealer bill for this because nobody knows what it means anymore and nobody's doing them anymore. So thank you so much. I appreciate Senator Abler's support on this bill and um, I look forward to repealing it someday. The bill's being moved to add finance. So thank you, Senator. I'll move that this bill is uh, passed and recommended re refer to the Committee on Education Finance. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Senator Kunish, whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready, Senator Kunish. Next up is Senate File um, 1476. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 1476 is uh, the Ethnic Studies Bill, and I do have an amendment I'd like to share with you. It's the A1 uh, Amendment. And um, what the A1 amendment does is it clarifies that the bill creates an ethnic studies graduation requirement for high school students and that districts have the flexibility to offer that course under social studies or language arts, science, art, or a required elective. It also adds language related to the Karen community. It provides greater flexibility to school districts on how to gather community input related to the ethnic studies offerings. It adds two school administrators to the composition of the working group, and it includes disability status as an additional category in the description of the demographics of the working group. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Um, so you, did you move your amendment? No, I'm sorry. Um, um, Mr. Chair, I would ask you uh, to move Senate file 1476 for possible inclusion or moving on to um, the next committee. Did, but we have to vote on the author's amendment. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm confused then. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> so um, does somebody want to move the author's amendment? She, she, did. she already did. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Be Thank you. So um, this is an opportunity to embed our uh, ethnic studies into our curriculums. Minnesota's K-12 student population is rapidly becoming more diverse, but the classroom learning experience in our state does not yet reflect our student population. Students of all racial and ethnic identities in Minnesota will benefit from instructional content that better reflects the diversity of their classrooms and their communities. This piece of uh, legislation, the Ethnic Studies for All, offers the opportunity to bridge the ethnic and cultural divide in Minnesota classrooms by incorporating ethnic study instruction for all students. Senate File 1476 will provide access to ethnic studies for all K-12 students, including an ethnic studies graduation requirement for high school students. It will create an ethnic studies advisory working group composed of a diverse array of educators, students, and community experts to advise MDE on ethnic study content and standards. And it also provides support and aid to school districts in the development and implementation of ethnic studies curriculum tailored to their community needs and interests. I think we um, can all agree after hearing some of the other pieces of legislation we heard this afternoon that all students and teachers 
and administrators, anyone who works within our school system and in our community, deserve to see themselves, their own cultures, their communities, their histories within our educational system. When students see themselves and their communities reflected in their curriculum, they become more engaged in their learning. They have a greater sense of belonging and they achieve much better educational outcomes. Ethnic studies also benefit students of all racial and ethnic identities. Our students today are growing up in a more globalized and intersected world. Ethnic studies invite students to be more deeply, to more deeply explore the many diverse cultures and histories within our state and our country, and in doing so, gain a better understanding of their, themselves and their classroom and build empathy. Ethnic studies equip students with the knowledge and the perspective to live and lead in a more diverse, globalized, and interconnected world. Over 30 schools, school districts across Minnesota currently offer ethnic study courses. And many of the members of this committee right here represent school districts that currently offer those ethnic studies courses. Students in both Bloomington and Rochester public school districts, uh, represented by Senator Mann and Senator Bolden, have the option to take ethnic studies. The Rochester School District says this course centers on the knowledge and perspective of diverse and ethic, ethnic and racial groups and reflects narratives, points of view, and scholarship rooted in these groups' lived experiences. Students in the Anoka Hennepin School District, Senator Abler's area, have the option to take honors African American history or a class called Multicultural Perspectives where students analyze how we each experience the world differently through the multi -general, multicultural lens based on race, gender, ethnicity, LGBTQ+, and disability. Chair Swadzinski represents Eden Prairie High School where students can take African American studies and students in my own school district of Columbia Heights can take multicultural studies or American Indian studies. These examples illustrate that our school communities are increasingly recognizing the value of ethnic studies. And these courses are being offered all over the state. Hibbing, Worthington, Mankato, and many others. Of the 11 school districts regions in Minnesota, nine of these regions have schools that offer courses that categorize as ethnic studies. But too many students in our state will still lack access to the social, cultural, and educational benefits of ethnic studies, which is what this bill seeks to address. So Senate File 1476 will ensure that all Minnesota students are able to benefit from an ethnic studies in their very own classroom. And if you'd like, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I can walk through the bill if you'd like, or we can go right on to testifiers. I say we go right on to testifiers. But if there's parts of the bill you'd like to highlight for us. I think, like I think we're OK. We can go on to testifiers. OK. So first, we have a, a student from Johnson High School. Hi. Welcome to the committee. Hi. Um, Dear Chair and Minnesota Education Policy Committee members, my name is Ina Strong and I am a 10th grader at Johnson Senior High School. I want your support for the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Bill HF1502 and SF1476. Ethnic studies is crucial to our schools because it not only validates and affirms our existence, but also gives us the critical tools necessary to thrive and be successful. I go to a school that currently has critical ethnic studies this has impacted me by helping me have critical consciousness into a better understanding of who I am. Ethnic studies has given me the opportunity to seek for who I am and help acknowledge that not everyone heals the same or is treated the same, but together in a community, we can collectively learn and heal together at our own pace. Ethnic studies is also important because it helped a lot of students, including me, recognize the hardships that several people of color have been through. In a lot of social study classes I have been in, None of them really touch bases with cultural and personal identity. The existence of ethnic studies is just the start of something great. Ethnic studies is needed in schools because it not only helps you understand your own cultural wealth and personal identity, but it helps you understand other cultures and other identities. It shows those who have been oppressed and how we can collectively change that. 
For students of color, I know this class means a lot to them, but I also know that the effect of this class is strong enough to have an impact on those students who think that this class is unnecessary. I've seen my own peers grow intellectually so much throughout the fall semester of this course. Again, I urge you to support ethnic studies and ensure it moves through, through committees. Thank you for taking the time to hear from me about this important issue. And we thank you for missing some of your class um, today to testify. Superintendent. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Kunish, members of the committee. I just, first of all, great job uh, representing Johnson. Um, thank you for testifying today. And thank you for uh, carrying Senate file 1476, Senator Kunish. You know, today is the 166th anniversary of the Dred Scott decision where the Supreme Court ruled that black people were not citizens and they could not take action in a United States court. Um, so uh, again, uh, in, a, in a, a country that is mirrored in, in history that has benefited many, but not all, um, I think it's a really appropriate day for us to be having this, uh, this hearing. Recently, I submitted a letter to support ethnic studies as a required high school course. I'm proud to report that St. Paul Public Schools School Board adopted a policy in 2021 to require that ethnic studies become a graduation requirement for our students, starting with the class of 2025. Currently, all 10th graders are taking ethnic studies this school year, and this was the culmination of work led by our student leaders who engage with their fellow students, community members, uh, numerous meetings and forums, reviewing research and pedagogy to advocate for this policy change. We've received feedback that 93% of students would recommend this course in surveys that we gave out uh, to our first semester students. The high school requirement is an interdisciplinary course that examines students' identity, heritage, culture, and communities in relation to various power structures, forms of oppression, and inequalities that have an impact on their lives. With an emphasis on stories and lived experiences of people, and people of color in the United States, the course explores collective struggles, resilience, and triumphs of their communities. We have established an Ethnic Studies Advisory and Community Collaborative Group, which meets regularly to collaborate on the Ethnic Studies course curriculum and programmatic activities. This is a direct partnership with SPPS so that the course will be reflective of the needs and wants of the community we serve. In your packet, you have a long list of goals that our district, our educators, and our community will continue to seek. As one of the few school districts to have an Ethnic Studies graduation course requirement, we couldn't have done this work without our young people, like Inus. The success of our program could be a model for other school districts to replicate in the ongoing struggle to ensure all Minnesota students can excel, have access to equitable opportunities, and improve educational outcomes. I'm not suggesting that history should be changed or excluded. Instead, I'm asking that our children, their families, and communities are seen, heard, and valued in their educational journeys. We are excited about advancing this work with our students, educators, and community, and I ask you to please support Senate File 1476. Thank you very much. Ms. Torres. Good afternoon. My name is Itlali. And I'm a representative of, a, of the students of El Colegio High School who support Ethnic Studies for All Bill, SF1476. Ethnic Studies for me means learning about different communities, including my own, getting a full experience in how different people live and have lived here in the United States and in the world. These classes are changing my perspective and understanding of the world. They leave me a little more insight into who I am and with something I can give back to my community. They help me face the world I'm going to live after high school. The number of students of color in secondary education are very low. With ethnic studies, students can feel more comfortable with the educational system and have the confidence to continue their education after high school. In my science, technology, engineering, our MS class, or STEAM, we did various projects to understand the idea of, of intersectionality. I gained a new understanding of concepts that I didn't know were connected. In my college and career readiness or escalera class, I gained a better understanding of myself, the power I have, and how to prepare for the future. 
These classes give me the tools and resources to strengthen, strengthen my knowledge and my community. My education makes me feel included and that I'm a part of society. My education makes me motivated to achieve goals that I thought were not possible. My education makes me confident in, in my ability to overcome all challenges that come my way. For these reasons, I support the Ethnic Studies for All bill. Make Ethnic Studies a graduation requirement for all Minnesota students in order to improve our society and the future of so many. Mr. Osborne, thank you for that testimony, by the way, Ms. Torres. Um, I wish I had that many people taking pictures of me when I come up to speak <laughs> that you had. Uh, members of the Senate Policy uh, Committee, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm Robert Osborne from Roseville. I am a senior fellow with Wilberforce International Institute, and I speak in opposition to the Ethnic Studies Bill as proposed. I have a PhD in intercultural, uh, intercultural and international education from the University of Minnesota, and in fact, my focus really is on intercultural competence. I've worked for over 38 years with uh, thousands of international students, primarily at the University of, of Minnesota. I believe that learning about the cultural backgrounds of our citizens and others is very, very important, and I celebrate that. But this legislation mandates, mandates an ideologically loaded version of ethnic studies that violates long-standing standards that forbid public entities from advantaging one particular religious or philosophical viewpoint over others. Ethnic studies in this legislation that you have before you is defined specifically as the critical, and that's the important word there, it's critical study of race, ethnicity, and indigeneity. The word critical refers to an ideology that says that oppression is what defines the human problem. And that the solution to oppression is to uplift the oppressed and to bring down the oppressors. Now, in addition to that, as the teacher of an online course on comparative worldviews, I can assure you that this postmodern ideology undermines the search for truth by insisting that the only relevant factor in, in social relationships is power. It is wrong, I, I would maintain, it is wrong to write religious or philosophical mandates into, into legislation for our pluralistic society, if only because it violates our country's First Amendment, but also because it violates our solidarity or our attempts for solidarity and pluralistic Minnesota. As legislators concerned for public justice, we must not ignore the ways that ideology is smuggled into otherwise fine-sounding legislation. A second reason that I oppose this legislation as it is written is that it will, instead of building bridges, which I would love to see that happening, it will actually, I believe, increase misunderstanding and hostility at the very time that we need to build understanding and appreciation for our cultural backgrounds. It does this by focusing on race in particular, and you look at the bill that's emphasized. Not only is the concept of race a problematic social con construct that was formerly used to discriminate in particular against people with black skin, but by insisting on it as a central feature of our social lives, we will foster division and confusion instead of solidarity. Now, eight of my 12 uh, grandchildren are 50% Asian. With this bill's focus on race, what are they to do? Must they be divided against themselves 
thus adding more psychological burdens to students already suffering high rates of mental illness? Must they claim an Asian, Hmong, or Chinese identity just because of a false construct that seeks to pigeonhole them? In a state known for its high percentage of interracial marriages, this bill will create enormous problems in the long run for children and their families. In a society where in several generations, long after my lifetime, but in several generations, most people will possess very complex racial, ethnic, and cultural ancestries due to this very intermarriage. This bill, with its intense focus on race in particular, will set up irresolvable social dilemmas. And it will drain valuable ener energies that should be devoted to solving problems. My third reason for objecting. The bill specifically says there must be established an ethnic studies working group. I'm troubled because this working group will be completely appointed by the Commissioner of Education. I think that is a power that is unworthy or should not be given to the, to the Commissioner alone, but the Commissioner in the bill, as it's written, says that they will uh, seek advice from the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Coalition, a coalition that is completely dominated by those whose ideology, the ide ideology of postmodernism and critical theory, that is, uh, is, is at, at odds with most Minnesotans. Using such a group to recommend people for the education for this uh, working group would be akin to using a committee of clergymen to advise the commissioner on how to formulate character education in our state. Would you be comfortable with that? Finally, I oppose this bill for one last reason, because it does little to re reduce the astonishing disparities in acad academic achievement between Asian and white students on one hand and black Native American Latino students on the other hand. Um, we already heard that, that uh, teachers are very busy Sir, in Sir, if you state. could wrap up, please. Yes, I will. And so um, the, the, the emphasis that I want to bring in my final point here is that that this will not really help uh, break down or reduce the disparities that we have between those who do well and those who do poorly. And those who cite the San Francisco study as proponents uh, need to read the details in which the study's authors themselves said it was too small a, um, a sample to measure the effects on black and Latino students, and they cautioned against taking the results too seriously. Thank you very much. Members? Uh, Senator excuse Dr. me. Before that begins, may I just make a comment here? S Senator Kunish? And you can sign in there if you would. Sure. Um, I, the gentleman next to me has a very unique viewpoint of this and um, obviously is, has had uh, decades of education, but I think we also have to listen to the real life experiences of not only those students in our classrooms, but our community members. Um, when we talk about, um, uh, I forget what, the, what it was, uh, the, when you talked about the definition of, of being critical, um, critical means expressing or involving an, um, an analysis of the merits and faults. That's what being critical is. is. You look at something and you, you study, you learn about the good and the bad and the ugly, and you learn from that so that we don't repeat the bad and the ugly anymore, but we celebrate the really good that comes out of our communities. Um, Ethnic studies is a curriculum for all students to provide important insights of their own heritage and that of others in their increasingly racial, ethnic, culturally, and ling linguistic diverse society. My children's father is from Beirut, Lebanon, a little country that I didn't even know where it existed until I met him. And through that relationship, I learned so much about the world. I learned about the culture of the Middle East, the food, uh, the language, the role that the Middle East has played in, in the world. 
And when my children were young and I looked for information or literature um, on the culture of, of Lebanon and the Middle East, there was next to nothing. So how could I help them understand their father's culture? How could I help them understand the, uh, the civil war that was going on in that, in that, that country? What drove their father to the United States? All of those things are so important to understand for, for children in this world today and for people in this world today. That's the kind of world that we have ethnic studies. So when we had um, culture day at their school and they would dress in their, their, um, their Lebanese gowns and bring the Lebanese food and teach their, their friends to say hello, goodbye, or whatever it was in, in Arabic, that made them so proud. And to this day, uh, my little granddaughters are learning Arabic as they grow up. When, she, when little Rita asks for my, it's water. And everybody around them, even the daycare lady now knows when Rita says my, she's asking for water. This is the kind of world that we ought to be living in and not trying to separate each other. Um, there was a question about uh, teachers have so much on their, ta their plates already, right? Well, so do our kids and our kids of color who have the largest disparities right now. What better can we do than to address them as the unique persons that they are, to celebrate and understand and learn where they have come from and why they are here in this place, and what their role as an American, as a community member is. How much better can we do within these kind of, of um, these kind of programs. And we know that when kids see themselves in, the, in the, their uh, curriculum, when they hear the language, when they see a teacher that knows them, that speaks their language, understands them, they do better in every aspect of their education. We retain those students, we retain their, inf their uh, interest and their attention, and their graduation rates grow, go up. Um, I'm trying to think of what else was said here that, that kind of spurred me on, but uh, you know, this gentleman is coming at a very high academic level, and uh, I just again want to just bring it back to our kids, to our schools, and, and the, uh, the importance of acknowledging them. Thank you, Senator. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we're running short of time, so I'll be as brief as possible. Um, uh, our last uh, testifier may have had a unique perspective or one that was maybe, uh, I think as was described, a highly academic one, but I can certainly affirm that it is not unique just to him. There are plenty others out there that I've heard voice very similar sentiments. Uh, that being said, um, just a couple of things. Uh, I appreciate that uh, it was shared that certain districts have taken it upon themselves in the state of Minnesota to implement uh, aspects of ethnic studies as they see fit, as their communities see fit, as their districts, teachers, administrators see fit. I think that's the biggest difference between what we see in the state and what this bill would propose. They had the option to do it in the way they wanted to and in the way they thought was best. Uh, this bill is a little bit different as it would mandate it from a top-down level from the state of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Education uh, rather than allowing districts and communities to, to come about it organically. We already talked about adding to teachers' plates. This is not the only bill in which that came up today. We keep talking about how um, our te and I'm not even talking about it, I'm just sh sharing from you what I hear from teachers. They have too much on their plate. We keep piling more on there. We're not taking anything away um, and we're expecting them to do it all. And we say that we hear them, we acknowledge that they have a lot on their plate and then we continue to pile it on like we're at a buffet. Uh, that's just not gonna work. Uh, I agree. Uh, students, it has been proven, students do better when they have uh, folks in the classroom that look like them. And we'll talk a little bit about that later when it comes to tier two licensure and what's being proposed here in the legislature. Again, we've got to be consistent with the legislation that we're talking about and how it's going to impact our schools. Um, you know, ethnic studies is, is not to be confused with talking about cultural diversity. Uh, I think everybody would agree, and it is, it is a founding American tenant principle and value that diversity 
is a good thing, whether it be race, whether it be religion, whether it be how you view life. Ethnic studies is not the same as saying that we are celebrating cultural diversity if you read some of the definitions of the language in the bill. If that were the case, this bill wouldn't be that controversial. Uh, I'm just going to look at page four, specifically lines 4.24 to 4.27. I'm just going to read a little bit. Ethnic studies analyzes the ways in which race and racism have been and continue to be powerful social, cultural, and political forces in the connection of race or other groups of stratification, including gender, class, sexuality, religion, and legal status. Uh, I think that's what the last testifier was getting at when he talked about ideologically loaded. And I can't tell you how many times I heard from parents, regardless of their political ideology, they said over and over again, just keep politics out of the classroom. Please help my kids learn the basic academic instruction that they need, reading, writing, math, science, what have you. And perhaps something like this is better situated as an elective and not a requirement to graduate. That would be a happy medium. On page five, uh, lines 5.4 to 5.6, it talks about school districts and charter schools must provide ethnic studies instruction in elementary schools and middle schools. This is not just a high school course requirement that's being proposed. This is saying we're gonna embed it from K through 12. In the bill earlier, Senate file 2442, we were talking about uh, teaching kids about the Holocaust and genocide, that was limited to middle and high school education. This goes even beyond that in how early we're trying to introduce kids to this and um, trying to mandate it within our districts. Uh, also on page five, lines 5.11 to 5.13, it says rulemaking. The commissioner of education must adopt rules for statewide academic standards for ethnic studies curriculum to be required for all kindergarten through grade 12 students. Again, getting back to just how pervasive this is gonna be for districts to try to wrap their heads around and try to implement. And Mr. Chair, I am almost done. Uh, page six, I'm gonna read you lines 6.26 to 6.29, which talk about model curriculum that the department should create. It should include uh, a power, race, class, and gender analysis as part of the course via literature, discussion, classwork, and homework as the analysis relates to ethnic studies courses and include an intersectional analysis of climate, health, food, housing, education, and the last word is policy. If that is not a blatant sidestep from academic instruction, I don't know what is. We're not just mandating that we have to uh, teach about ethnic studies or diversity. We're saying that you have to teach it through the lens of all these highly political things. And that does not compute with what we're being told by parents and even teachers when they say you're making our job much more difficult when you keep infusing all this politically loaded and charged stuff. It's distracting and it's not allowing us to focus on the true academic instruction that the kids need. We've got kids that need to play catch up. I toured a charter, I toured a charter school last week and part of the conversation uh, was about why they are seeing kids opt to go to their school or other schools rather than public schools. And the political aspects of what's finding its way into the classroom was one of the number one things cited as why folks are choosing other schooling options. And I think that's why unfortunately our state has seen a slight decline in public school enrollment. That's not healthy. Folks, I don't wanna see enrollment in our public schools decline. I would love to see the opposite, but we have to stop giving parents reasons to go elsewhere. And bills like this don't help that cause. Uh, it only seeks to further polarize and divide us. And here's what I remember from being a kid in public school. We learned about diversity and how great it was how it was an American value. We learned about equality and how that was worth defending and fighting for. We talked about tolerance regardless of how people look, regardless of the religion they practice. Those are all things that we can get behind and those things are, are being taught in our schools. This is gonna heighten and detract from the good lessons that we're teaching kids as it pertains to that. And I'll finish by saying this, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my great grandfather was born in Mexico. 
you might not guess with the last name like Duckworth, that I have a pretty diverse family uh, and have been raised to appreciate, love, and value that diversity. This bill is almost an insult to it, to be honest with you. It's certainly not what I learned growing up when it comes to uh, respecting cultures, learning from one another, valuing contributions from everyone. And uh, I, I think that there may be some merit to some aspects of cultural diversity, et cetera, being taught in our schools. But this bill and how ethnic studies is defined and what it calls for in terms of a mandate is, uh, is a big negative for our public schools and for our kids. Thank you. Senator May Quaid. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Kunish for bringing this. And I, I have a little bit of a different opinion from, from Senator Duckworth. Um, it is great that we learn about diversity. It's great that we learn about equality. I don't love the word tolerance because it tells people that they should like withstand your presence. But that actually doesn't get to the heart of what education is about. When we are in the classrooms, and I'm gonna say we like you and myself, right? When we are in the classrooms, we learn about people who don't look like us, people who do not share our ethnic heritage, people who aren't like our parents or our grandparents. And <clears throat> It's not just a disservice to kids in the classroom who are indigenous, black, Latina, Latino, Asian, um, but it's a disservice to white kids as well. And it is so important that when we are educating our students that we are doing so full history warts and all. And I think one of the things that has happened uh, is that our existence has been politicized. And then when we bring bills to make sure that we learn about people who look like us or our parents or our grandparents, people say that's politics. You're bringing politics into the classroom if you teach people, teach young people about different kinds of people that they're learning about now. And so I really want us to, to one, um, understand that's kind of offensive to folks who look like Senator Kunish or myself or Senator Mann or Senator Champion that by saying, by teaching kids about the ways in which this state and this country have gone about using power over race and class and gender to oppress or keep behind or to harm, that it's politicized, that's offensive to our existence. It's offensive to our existence. And so I wanna thank you for bringing this bill because we have seen these attacks on public education for teaching whole history, warts and all, um, for teaching all kids in the class, for teaching all sorts of viewpoints. And I think this bill does, goes a long way to making sure that um, we have more students in our classroom, in our public schools, because this bill doesn't exist yet. So if we're seeing a decline in public schooling, I wonder if it's because we don't have education that reflects the full breadth of who we are as people. And I think a little bit about when I was looking at um, Lines uh, 6.24 to 6.29, um, an intersectional analysis of climate, health, food, housing, education, and policy, um, and above that, what it was related to. I, I keep thinking about when we were learning in school about um, the women's rights movement and um, the 19th Amendment and women getting the right to vote, and my mom saying, well, not all women. Let me tell you a little bit more. And then uh, talking about how you know women can do anything they want to, and my mom took out her credit card and she put it in front of me, and it still said Mrs. Ron May. It didn't even say her own name on it. And so I, you know these are really like that wasn't that long ago. I was old enough to read, and it wasn't what I was learning in school. Right? We were learning that equality is great, and it is great. But if we learn that as if it is present, if we learn that as if all of the harm that was done with power to race, class, gender then we pretend that it didn't happen and that it's not still happening and we can't fix it. And we're not preparing our littlest people to be those change makers, mm -hmm. to make things different. So I, I think this is a great bill and I think that this is gonna um, lead to a lot of leaders in our state. So I, I appreciate you bringing it. Thank you, Senator Gabler. And well, I, actually this is a really good discussion, Mr. Chair. I, um, I, I'm not gonna add a lot of the length to it. I just have a, some questions and an observation, but this discussion should be a longer one. And I, I appreciate the comments from Senator Kunish, Senator Duckworth, and Senator May Quaid on this as we're all being candid and trying to sort this out. And I think at the heart of it, 
I don't think you understand each other very well. I've been listening to Senator Kunish for a while, working with her on some tribal things that I was found interesting when I was a, a decade ago when I had the privilege to do a little bit of work as I saw some of the challenges and we gave White Earth their independence as a social service uh, account, uh, tribe, which I thought was great. Um, and, but I, um, I, I've had a number of conversations, especially with my black friends, and they have felt that they have to work half again as hard to get to the same. Twice as hard. Twice? Twice. Right, twice as hard, okay. To get to be the same, and I have no comprehension of that, because that's not how I see things in my world. Um, you know, and so, but I think it's important to recognize that people feel that way. And um, I think to understand that is helpful. Uh, but for me, Senator Kunish, you don't have to do anything different than just being you to make me respect you and the others. And I'm, I'm sorry it's gotten to that point. And I think that's part of the basis for our misunderstanding. And so who can be more powerful, and, but who can better understand? And I think that some of the this topics here has merit. Um, but I, I think when we talked before about some of the words used in the, the bill before that teaches a color, you don't want to drive people away while they're trying to understand. And so that's where I'll leave it at that, and we don't have more time. But I just, um, Senator Kunish, um, the governor's bill, which is before us next, has some similar definitions. The definition of ethnic studies is different in both of those. Um, and there's a bunch of work a bunch of ideas to how to embed that along the way. Uh, are you comfortable explaining how yours is different from that? Are you familiar enough to, to know about Senate File 1311 and the governor's bill to contrast what yours is? Because I honestly do not know the difference. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am not comfortable doing that right here, right now, because um, I would need to review both of them and do a little bit of my own homework to ensure that I'm giving you the correct information. And if that's something that you feel needs to be done, we can work on that. And that, I'm sure, will come up on Wednesday. No, and I appreciate that. And so, so it, uh, there are, actually, there are people, Senator May Quaid, who are already concerned about the direction some of this topic is going, I think partly through their own misunderstanding and uh, about what it is that people are trying to say, what they're not trying to say. My district has been in the middle of volatile arguments. And I can see both sides. And the district's tried to weave through and have a meaningful, we have cited for some of the classes we have. St. Paul's got classes for sophomores uh, that they came up as their way to do it. And in a kind of limited way, and they're kind of, you were cheering them for what they did. So um, I, um, I don't know, we're, we're going to be working on this, this, um, this other bill a little later in, in tomorrow. But I, I think, if you want my advice, uh, I think the example of the studies of the Holocaust and those horrible tragedies, uh, there's a good model there where you get a consensus about how to do it with people that are well put together. Uh, and then we do that instead of just simply imposing. And so I, I am, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of people, there's more people interested in this topic than everybody might think who feels like they're not. And they're waiting to come to understand. And out of fear, both sides retreat. And that doesn't get us anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, I guess I would echo some of what Senator Duckworth was saying. Um, you know, I definitely was brought up to treat people as you're treated and everybody's equal, um, everybody's the same. Um, that's, that's the America I grew up in. Um, I don't know how we are exactly where we are right now. I haven't shared, I don't think I've shared this story yet in this committee, but um, you know, I had, a, I had a class in 2001 at St. Cloud State University and I had a minority studies class. Very first day of class, my teacher said, all white people are racist, um, most males are sexist, and that, that's what she presented to us. It's not how I was raised, that's not how I was brought up, and I, I don't think that's healthy. We need to teach in ways to bring people together, not divide. Um, I'm not saying this bill's doing that, or that's the focus of that, but if we're gonna teach something where we want to teach different backgrounds, we have to do it in a way that we're not hurting each other. So, um, but I think is kind of ironic about that class, so we can half into that class, two black female students turned that teacher in for being racist, and she had to stop her 
uh, I don't know the, the, how she was expressing herself in class. No, these are this was 22 years ago in central Minnesota. These black females were raised in central Minnesota, and they said what you're saying is wrong. So how do we go from we weren't like that to where we are now? If we're not, if we're, maybe it's because we're teaching it at the college level, um, and that that would be inappropriate then. So that's when maybe we see this here. If we've gone through that in these classes, uh, we need to figure out a better way to, to, to come together. And if, if this feels like someone's being pushed away and hated on, I, you know what I'm trying to say? Uh, if we're gonna teach this, we can't be saying white people are bad, is what I'm trying to get at. And that's, you know, that's how I feel. I wasn't raised that way and that's very, um, it's unfortunate that these things come up, even if we go back to what happened on the Senate floor the other night. That's not how I was raised, and it's, it's wrong. So we need to work on coming together, and we need to teach in a way that brings people together. We need to not divide. We need to come together, and, and that's what we need to do. So thank you. Last word, Senator Kunish. Sure, and uh, I just want to, I mean, nobody, nobody should be you know, going through that kind of an experience. And that's why this ethnic uh, studies program is so important. And I just wanna bring you back to what this bill actually does. It um, is going to provide access to ethnic studies for our K-12 kids. It is going to create an ethnic studies advisory working group. So hopefully there are not folks like the ones that you might have um, run into that is composed of a very diverse array of educators, of students and community experts to advise the Minnesota Department of Education on ethnic studies content and standards. And then it's going to provide aid to the schools. So the schools don't have to figure this all out on their own. It's going to provide aid to the school districts in the development and the implementation of ethnic study curriculum tailored to their community needs and interests. And while some folks might think that, you know, kindergartners are too young to be learning about these things, I would never underestimate the wisdom and the knowledge and the life experience of little five-year-olds, six-year-olds, some of the best life lessons I have learned are from those little kiddos. And so please, let's never underestimate the power of our, our students. And with that, I ask for your support. Mr. Chair. Request we do have one more bill, but go ahead. Request a roll call. Okay. Roll call has been asked for, roll call, call granted. Um, do you need to make a motion, um, Senator? No, okay. Yeah, you record it. Okay, so um, we're gonna refer this bill to state and local gov and um, veterans. So roll call's been requested. So. Senator Abler. No. Senator Bolden. Aye. Senator Coleman. No. Senator Duckworth. No. Senator Hostchild? Aye. Senator Kunish? Aye. Senator Mann? Aye. Senator McQuaid? Aye. Senator Wiesenberg? No. Chair Swadzinski? Yes. Um, the vote is six ayes, four noes. The motion carries. We'll be sending. We'll be sending it to state, local government, um, veterans. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for the vibrant discussion as well, everybody. One bill. Senator Swazinski, you are uh, moving Senate file 1311 before the body. Please feel free to uh, begin your presentation. Okay, um, and I just want to remind the pages and everybody else if we could just stick these, the amendment and the bill back into your folders. Because oh. we're going to be using them again on Wednesday. And, just to save the paper. Sounds good. Um, so Senator Swazinski, would you like to move the A3 amendment? I would, thank you. Senator Swazinski moves the A3 amendment. 
Oh, uh, wait a minute. So uh, we're not taking a vote today. My Thank apologies. You. Just, oh, not on the A3 amendment? Oh, okay. No. Apparently, no. You. Senator Swazinski, to your presentation. Um, so <clears throat> we'll be hearing when, today is just basically a walk through the bill by Ms. Lewis. Uh, Wednesday we'll be doing the amendments and the testimony, or not, well, your comments and questions um, by the members of the committee. So that's the plan. Um, and so with that said, Ms. Lewis, take it away. Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Abler. Just a suggestion, you can do what you want, but uh, 1311 was out, and people are familiar with that bill. Maybe you just want to suggest what changes are there from the previous underlying bill. That might save you some time. Senator Abler, I think Ms. Lewis will be going through that. Right. Uh, Ms. Lewis? Okay, Madam Chair and members, uh, if you all have the um, delete all in front of you, I will walk you through the changes as it um, uh, was introduced to so the additions to the language uh, that was in the original Senate file. So the first uh, addition change is on page four. Um, if you first start on um, page four, lines one through five, that language came from Senate file 618, which was the chairperson's uh, civic education uh, bill. Then on page four as well, further down at line 10 through 19, was a, um, a, the personal finance bills from Senator Dreheim and the chairs at Senate file 901 and Senate file uh, 242. Then um, the next addition is on page 16. If you go down to starting on line 20, it's section 14. That was um, from Senate file 1012, which was Senator Duckworth's bill. The next change is uh, on page 23, section 26. Um, I forgot the Senate file number, but that was the school trust lands director. It was Senator Kunish's bill. And then the next change is um, line 27. Or sorry, page 27, line 37, in the repealer, there's an additional um, section being repealed, 120B.02, subdivision 3, that came from uh, Senate File 618 of the Civics Education Bill. Then on page 29, uh, section 3, at uh, line 3, is uh, Senator Bolden's bill, Senate File 366. Uh, if you go further down on that same page, section four, uh, the suicide prevention information is from Senate file 418, which was uh, Senator Westland's uh, uh, bill. <clears throat> then the next addition is all the way on page 51. Uh, if you go down to lines uh, 23 through 28, uh, those lines came from uh, Senator Coleman's Senate file 1858. And then again, uh, um, an addition from Senator Coleman's bill uh, is on page 55 in section six. And then, uh, then on page 61, uh, lines seven through 11 came from uh, Senate, file, Senate file 1024, which is Senator May Quaid's bill. And then, on uh, page 63, section 14 is another section from uh, the final section from Senator Coleman, Senate file 1858. And that actually takes several pages, but that's the last addition um, in the, uh, that you find in the amendment. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Members? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, congratulations, Senator Swazinski. You have put together the least controversial education budget po or policy bill I've ever seen. No one has comments? Oh, Madam Chair, Senator. just not to increase your... I, I'm an optimist as well. So uh, I think the additions are marvelous. So but I think we'll discuss it a little bit more on Wednesday. So I, I presume you don't want any questions today, Mr. Chair. Senator We just quit on time. I'm good with quitting on time, so... Well, we have three minutes, Senator, oh. so <laughs> use them wisely. 
Um, Senator Abler. I think I'll be wise and ask my questions on Wednesday. So unless somebody else has a question. Thanks. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just give a, uh, a comment in, in preparation for the work we'll do later this week. But uh, it's not lost on me, Mr. Chair, that you've done a great job having both Democrats and Republicans up there to testify and present bills. And that this bill reflects um, the bills from both sides of the aisle. And that's not lost on us. Appreciate it. You've been true to your word. Uh, so no matter how the discussion goes on Wednesday, please don't forget that uh, I shared how much I am appreciative of how you, how you have approached this so far. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. I'm going to print those words <laughs> as a reminder. Thank you, um, Senator Sissinski. Um, if I, sorry. Mm -mm. Um, I think we forgot to also acknowledge there's a little bit of um, um, Dre Hyman here as well, perhaps. No? Oh, she, she mentioned that. Sorry, yep. I forgot that. Senator Abler. I felt like in that my head I had a little bit of Erica in my head. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Senator Abler. Mr. Chair, a lot of us think a little bit of Senator Dre Hyman is probably enough. But um, anyway, is there going to be an author's amendment to this? Uh, amendment. Well, Senator Swazinski. Besides, not just yes, to delete Senator all, Abler. but is there going to be a, an additional amendment? Senator Swazinski. To your draft? Yes. I, I'm okay, and that'll be published soon. Senator Abler. Oh, that's sorry. Madam Chair and Mr. <laughs> Senator Swazinski, that'll be, that's not published yet, and when will that be available? Senator Swazinski. Tomorrow. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? No, I. Oh. Senator Swazinski, you have the floor. I just want to thank Ms. Lewis. It's a lot of work to put together a policy bill. I thank you for your kind words to Senator Duckworth and anxiously await um, your comments on Wednesday and all members of the committee as well. I hope for a vibrant, um, robust debate because it's, it's been a trademark, a trademark of this committee this year. And I appreciate everybody's respectfulness. and. Um, this session. So anyways, thank you again, Ms. Lewis, for your hard work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Sosinski. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>